Hello everyone, thanks for watching the presentation on the R package SVARS. So what is SVARS and how can you use this package? So in, let's consider you have a time series data set in an economic context, for instance, inflation and interest rates, and you want to perform analysis like uh, Granger causality, checking for Granger causality or forecasting one of the series. Then you can use the so-called workhorse model in multivariate time series and this is the VAR or vector autoregressive model as it is defined here in equation one. So these models are also called reduced form models and they are pr pretty straightforward to estimate for instance with least squares or maximum likelihood estimation. Um, in case the question on your data set is a bit differently, for instance you want to see what happens in case of an unexpected supply shortage or how can a central bank lower inflation, then this model cannot be used here so in, in this version because this error term ut here is serially but usually not contemporaneously uncorrelated, which means we cannot simulate here isolated shocks um, because these shocks occur simultaneously. Um, a possible solution to this problem is to transform this reduced form into the structured form as it is defined in equation 3. And these models have an error term epsilon t, which is serially as well as contemporaneously uncorrelated, which means we can give each of these shock series a unique economic interpretation and interpret movements in the data here in this, in this yt vector as being driven by the, the cumulative effects of these structure shocks. So how can you think about this? Well, we can think about these reduced form error terms, which we can directly extract from the reduced form estimation as being actual combination or mixtures of these true underlying dynamics. For instance, supply shock and the demand shock, which in the end um, determine a price which we can observe. Yeah, so this is what we most mostly interested in, in, in at least in an economic context. So how do we get then these structural shocks? We have to get them or we want we, we get them by estimating the matrix B. So this key here basically to the structural universe. By we we get this matrix B by decomposing the covariance matrix of the reduced form error terms. So what is difficult now is that this decomposition of the covariance matrix into BB transpose here in equation 4 is not unique, so there are infinitely many solutions to this problem here. For instance, B could be a lower triangular matrix or an upper triangular or a symmetric decomposition. So of course this does not fit into an economic interpretation of uh, demand or supply shocks or demand and supply effects if there are infinitely many demand and supply shocks. So we have to somehow add some further information to somehow make this matrix be unique and to obtain unique um, structural shocks. So well, there are two main approaches on to do it. The first one is economic theory based. So here we use our economic knowledge to place restrictions either on B directly or on B with some other combination of matrices, short or long run restrictions. A drawback of this approach is that these uh, restrictions are usually just identifying, so meaning that we can neither test these restrictions nor we know whether these restrictions are correct and we cannot, um, well, we have no chance to, to um, obtain the correct or the true underlying dynamics in case these restrictions were wrong. So an alternative is to use instead of economic interpretation or economic knowledge using properties of the data. So this is the so-called data-based or statistic identification approaches. And this is exactly what we deliver here in this package. So we deliver here several um, statistical identification approaches for these structural shocks. So to be a bit more specific um, in what we are delivering here, in the world of the data-based identification approaches, there are again several, several other sub-approaches. Um, we focus here on two. The first one is based on heteroskedasticity, so we use, for instance, jumps in the covariance structure or conditional heteroskedasticity patterns in the, stru the structure shocks 
to identify them. The other approach is using independence. So in a non-Gaussian framework, we can look at higher order dependence between the structure shocks to uniquely determine them. Um, for the remainder of this package, I want to mainly focus or on this talk, I mainly want to focus on one specific model here, the smooth transition and covariance model from Ludwig von Um with, on, with which I'm going to show you how you can work with the package. But first, um, you may ask, um, why is it necessary to have so well, many different identification models which all do the same job in the end, estimating the structure shocks? Well, this depends on your data structure because these models have all distinct assumptions on, on your data. And of course, the heteroscity type models, for instance, need the particular type of heteroscity elasticity in order to estimate these structure shocks. If you have no heteroscity elasticity in the data, then you have no chance to get the um, true underlying dynamics. Um, in case you want to know a bit more about when to choose which model, we have another study here, which is on the topic of model selection and um, focus on the specific advantages and disadvantages of all these models. Okay, so the smooth transition and covariance models. So very briefly, what is the idea here? So the idea is that we have in the beginning of a sample, a specific, a specific covariance structure, sigma 1, and in the end of the sample, a different covariance structure, sigma 2. And in between, for each observation, we have a mixture of these two covariance stages. And at some point, we have more weight on the first covariance matrix. And in a, on one specific T here on one observation, we have more weight on the second one. And we uniquely identify these structure shocks if the structure shocks changes their covariance at a different rate. So if one uh, structure shock double its, co uh, its variance and the other one halves its variance, this allows us to identify these structure shocks. We model the smooth tra this transition between these covariance states with a logistic transition function and estimate the parameters via a Gaussian log likelihood estimation, a uh, log likelihood function. Um, what you see in the gray box is how we implemented this in R. So all our identification models start here with ID for identification and then the abbreviation ST stands for smooth transition. So you see here a lot of different input parameters um, because this model is rather flexible. However, we try to, do, try to implement it as user-friendly as possible. So all these input parameters are optional. The only thing you have to specify here is this x. And this x is an object of a reduced form estimation. So you first need to do a reduced form estimation and then transform it into the structure form. And where do you get this reduced form estimation? So this is how our package fits into the R world. So there are already a couple of packages on R which are frequently used. And all of them have the possibility, or you have the possibility with these packages to obtain your reduce form estimation and do a lot of other stuff, for instance, uh, lag or check for the lag order and perform this Granger causality analysis and so on and so on. So this is all in these packages, VARS and MTS and TSDyne. And you can do with them your reduce form estimation, obtain an object of class, let's say, var est. And this object can be passed to our svar function here, which is in this case x. Um, so this is how the SVAS package fits into the R world. So we did not re-implement here the reduce from estimation, but just build it upon the pre-existing packages. So besides these um, identification models, we deliver a whole toolbox of different bootstrap techniques, uh, tests on, let's for instance, identifying restriction or over-identifying restriction and some uh, popular SVAR uh, statistics like counterfactual historical decomposition. So really a whole battery of different tools for your uh, structural analysis in this time series context. So what you see here is a flow chart on um, how to use the functions or what is the ordering of how to use the functions in the package. So this green box here represents a function from outside our package. Yeah, so this here is the reduce form estimation here in this example the var function from the var pack, vars package and you run your reduce form estimation here get the object and might pass it or can pass it here to one of these structural um, form estimations um, 
also the possibility for pretest, uh, like show test, parameter stability, and so on. But this is optional, so you can directly pass it to one of these functions. Do not do not have to do any further specification here. Can directly uh, it works directly out of the box without any further specification. And then afterwards, when you obtain your structural estimate, you can pass it to one of the other functions here, for instance, to call to calculate uh, impulse response function or forecast error variance decompositions. Um, what I'm going to show you next is how this works in practice. And I'm going to show you this with first estimating a reduced from bar model from the VAS package, then pass this object to the smooth transition application model, and afterwards calculate impulse response functions jointly with confidence bands obtained by a wild bootstrap. So I'm going to show you this with an example of the replication study from Rutger Pohl and Lepsonayev. So this, um, the application is a very classical application in, in macroeconomics and um, very classical application of these SVAR models. So we look here at the interaction between monetary policy and stock markets in the US. We furthermore test some short and long run restrictions of Bernard and Leitimo. And we do this with a five dimensional data set from the time period from 1970 to 2007 at monthly frequency um, yeah, with some very classical uh, economic time series here. So this data set comes directly with the package. It is one of our um, example data sets. So once you have loaded the data set and the package, you can estimate the reduce form here with the VAS package. So I'm not going into more details here, but obtaining the reduce form R form. So this object here can by the directly pass to the smooth transition model without any further specification. So even though I did some specifications here, but this is completely optional. Um, I just want to mention here the NC. So the, the models can be computationally rather demanding. So that's why we implemented them in with RCBP into C++. Nevertheless, in high dimension and a lot of um, observation, it might take some time to calculate here these models, so we directly added the possibility of multi-cores. So in this case, I estimated here the model with on five cores on with multi-core. Okay, the resulting object is S form ST, and when we look here at the result, we see the summary of some general formation like the likelihood and sample size and so on. And here the estimated heteroscedasticity matrix. So this is here the change in the, in the covariance of the structural shocks. Um, this here is then the estimated B matrix, so the relation between the reduced form and the structural form. So the, the thing that unmixes the reduced form error to the structural, structural errors. And um, yeah, we know from the smooth transition model that we model here a transition from one covariance state to another. And this here is an illustration of the transition function in for this particular example. So the model um, searches for the transition point and the shape of the transition, so the speed of the transition endogenously. And this here is the result. And as economists, we might want to check is this here, um, is this a plausible model? And when we look here at uh, the transition function, so what happens during the 1980s in the US regarding monetary policy? So then we know that this here is the period of the great moderation, so a period. Um, uh, was a change in the covariance uh, in the central bank behavior, which resulted in a period of lower variance or lower variation in GDP and inflation. So we have seen that this model appears, appears to be plausible. We, we can, can furthermore test some economic restrictions. restrictions. So for instance, that this, this, this B matrix, matrix here, the, the, the structural impact, impact relation matrix might be a lower triangular matrix. matrix. So we can test this here by specifying a restriction matrix, the zero represent the restrictions, the NA are unrestricted elements, and then we can re-estimate the whole model, but with passing the restriction matrix to the function. And once we've done this, we can check at the blockyard ratio test here, for instance, and this tells us, okay, these restrictions are not supported by the data. So we are probably better off with using the unrestricted model. Finally, I just want to show you how we can obtain impulse responses with confidence bands. And we do this here by um, using a wild bootstrap and a fixed design with 1000 iterations and again on five cores. And this here is then the result. So I use your horse uh, confidence 
uh, halls percentiles and 68% confidence bands. We just look here at the fourth and fifth shocks and fourth and fifth variable. Um, since we are just interested here in the relation between stock market and monetary policy, so we only need these two shocks and variables. And um, yeah, what we see here is that monetary policy, so an, an increase of the interest rate from the central bank, lowers stock market returns, whereas there seems to be no feedback from stock market to monetary policy, at least no significant one. Okay, so that's it basically. Thanks for watching this video and I hope you have fun with using the SVARS package.